Uh, the hour of 10.30 having arrived, I'm going to call the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee to order. We don't have a quorum yet. I'm so here. I, I realize that, Representative <laughs> Hicks. <laughs> and I compliment you for being on time. Uh, so, Representative Coulter, uh, you're up first, so why don't you uh, present your bill and present the amendment, and when we have a quorum, we will act on it. So, Representative Coulter. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all um, for your time. Um, yeah, I think I will just sort of present the bill as it's constructed in the DE1, and then um, when we have uh, sufficient people power. Representative Coulter, we just have a quorum. It just arrived. I've always had great timing, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, I think it came by Amazon, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so in which case, I will move the DE1. All right, why don't you explain the bill first, and then Certainly. let's explain the DE1 after you explain the bill. Certainly. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, House File 4343 uh, relates to online program managers, or OPMs. Um, in the wake of the pandemic, obviously the move towards uh, more online offerings from colleges and universities accelerate, accelerated pretty significantly. Um, and as many schools experience enrollment challenges, online offerings, of course, represent a more flexible arrangement for potential students. Enter OPM. Uh, OPMs are private third-party entities that contract with the school to develop, deliver, and provide programs. These can be uh, run sort of the gamut of services from instructional design and technology, technology support to marketing and student recruitment, uh, including even potentially advising, grading, and academic coaching. As with many private companies, uh, there are good, bad, good actors and bad actors. Um, we are certainly aware that there are several schools in the University of California system that have contracted with the OPMs only to see deeply deceptive recruitment tactics that result in students receiving credentials that were worth less than advertised at the cost of significant debt. Um, we also know, we have heard directly from students who have um, felt misled uh, by the practices and, and descriptions, even um, working with OPMs, feeling as though they were working directly with uh, the particular institution. Um, I was previously only aware of uh, two schools in Minnesota that contract with OPMs, uh, St. Cloud State and Southwest Minnesota State. I was uh, told by someone yesterday that there may be more schools. Um, so I unfortunately uh, may have been given less than uh, up-to-date information there. Um, but really the, the purpose of this bill is to sort of get ahead of the problem, get ahead of the challenge that we've seen with OPMs across the country um, and put in place um, some accountability and transparency. Um, and so just uh, sort of very quickly here, I will run um, through the bill. Um, I guess, well, to start with... Um, Rep. Sam Coulter, I think you explained the bill. Why don't you go to your DE1 yes, amendment and explain the amendment. Um, and it's always been the uh, privilege of the author to put the bill in shape. So sure. you've moved your DE1 amendment. All those in favor of the DE1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Motion prevails. Now the bill is in the order that the uh, author wishes. Representative Coulter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, subdivision one um, really just defines the terms that this bill is operating under. Um, I will note that one particular difference between the DE and the previous bill was a, a tighter definition around the term online program manager that was developed with the Office of Higher Education. Uh, subdivision 2 prohibits uh, OPM contracts from including tuition sharing, uh, OPM authority over certain aspects of programs, and rights over uh, various uh, creations of faculty. Subdivision 3 uh, requires contract approval by the Minnesota State Board of Regent, or, um, Board of Trustees, excuse me. Uh, the bill does uh, likewise request that the University of Minnesota Board of Regents comply. Uh, subdivision 4 requires institutions to submit annual reports detailing enrollment and revenue in OPM-managed programs. Uh, and Subdivision 5 requires disclosure of the fact that, that these programs are managed by a third party managed by the OPM rather than by the individual institutions. Um, so that is um, 
So the, the short version of the bill, I think um, this is a, a really a first in the nation bill uh, that aims at protecting students, academic quality, and our state and federal tax dollars. And I'm certainly happy to answer questions. Why don't we, uh, Representative Coulter, have your uh, testifier. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Yes, um, honored and hallowed higher ed chair Pulowski. <laughs> Members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jenna Chernega. I'm the president of the Interfaculty Organization and a faculty member in sociology at Winona State University. Uh, in general, the federal government prohibits higher education institutions that receive federal dollars from entering into agreements with companies uh, that recruit students on a tuition share basis. That is, they prohibit colleges and universities from paying a portion of tuition per student to companies who do marketing and recruitment for them. The reason for this historical prohibition um, was that it leads to perverse incentives. Essentially, for-profit companies are rewarded for getting anyone and everyone to sign up for a college degree or program, regardless of whether they will be successful, whether it's a degree with job prospects, whether it's a student who can afford it, et cetera. There's an especially high incentive uh, to recruit students whose income is so low that they would qualify for enough federal and state aid to cover their entire tuition bill, thus letting the company benefit from federal and state dollars whether the student has the means to pay their bills or not. So the federal government has issued rules around its Title IV aid programs that restrict the use of such payment programs. However, in 2011, the feds issued a loophole in their sub-regulatory guidance in the rules that allow companies to be paid for recruiting and marketing with tuition share schemes. As long as they were also providing other services, such as curriculum design, student support services, or academic coaching. This opened the way for the rise of a new form of predatory company in the higher ed sector, online program managers, or OPMs. Ranking member of the Federal House Appropriations Committee, Representative uh, Rosa DeLauro, wrote last January that just like for, uh, predatory for-profit colleges, these OPMs mislead students and drive up costs. And depending on the program and the student, they can also leave students with lower value educations, excessive debt, and low paying jobs after graduation. Members of Congress have pushed back on the Department of Education asking for greater oversight of OPMs or to close the 2011 loophole that allows them to proliferate. Student lawsuits have sprung up around the country alleging poor quality, misleading marketing practices, and bait and switch type tactics. There have been dozens of articles in the higher education press describing the quite frankly slimy tactics of OPM companies. And now I understand why. In 2021, despite the protests of faculty, St. Cloud State University entered into a seven-year, $27 million contract with an OPM company called Academic Partnerships. This initial contract provided that Academic Partnerships would help faculty design and launch a set of online asynchronous graduate programs in an accelerated format. Instead of the normal 15-week semester, each course would take only seven weeks to complete. Academic partnerships would also market the programs and recruit students for them. In exchange, the company would receive 50% of the tuition of every student enrolled in one of the accelerated programs. Five, zero, 50% of the tuition. I want to make clear that if faculty and administrators believe that accelerated programs were the key to financial solvency, existing SCSU faculty are perfectly capable of creating seven-week programs and courses without having to pay a company 50% of the tuition. But instead, faculty in the affected programs were given mandates and short timelines to convert their courses into the online accelerated format. In addition, every faculty member in those programs had to sign an agreement to share their intellectual property rights for their course materials with the university, who could then do what they wanted with them, uh, including potentially handing them off to other faculty to teach with or sharing them with the company directly to be used elsewhere around the country. SCSU initially launched four accelerated online programs through the con contract with academic partnerships. These were graduate programs, and three of them failed to enroll any students and were discontinued. It became clear that the university was not going to be able to meet its profit obligations for the OPM company without expanding the scope of the programming significantly. 
So in November of 2022, the, the president of St. Cloud State University signed an addendum to the original contract, expanding the scope of, into the creation of accelerated online undergraduate programs, as well as additional graduate programs and graduate certificates. These programs were to be launched in the new format as soon as August of 2023 with the same 50% tuition share agreement. This was again done despite the protests of faculty and without consultation as far as we can tell with the Min State System Office or Board of Trustees. In the spring of 2023, the IFO raised the issue to the attention of the Min State System Office and asked for their intervention. The system office quickly looked into the issue and also found it concerning. They have put into place an approval system for any programs run through an OPM and have given St. Cloud State University permission to launch three of the original 11, uh, the originally 11 planned undergrad programs with significant reporting requirements. However, many of our concerns remain. We continue to be concerned about our colleagues' intellectual property rights, their academic freedoms, the quality of education students would be getting, and the financial sustainability of the entire contract. Faculty in these programs must have their course materials vetted and approved by an office established at St. Cloud State University that works closely with staff from academic partnerships. Once approved, faculty are told that they cannot change their course materials for three years meaning changes in their fields can't be implemented, activities can't be updated, instructions can't be improved, new texts can't be incorporated. The addendum was written to include some of St. Cloud State University's most popular undergraduate online programs, which would have to close because they're not allowed to compete with the academic partnerships version of the managed online programs. All of those existing students moved over to the OPM program would be sending now 50% of their tuition to the company rather than to the school where it had been going. Even when programs are successful, in quotes, there are concerns. The one graduate program that was successfully launched, the MBA program, has grown significantly from about 25 students in 2021 to hundreds of students today. However, no new faculty have been hired to teach in that program, uh, despite the dramatically increased number of students. It is simply a matter of cramming more and more students into bigger online classes. And those hundreds of students aren't from the new populations that weren't being served in Minnesota that academic partnerships had promised. Each semester that SCSU's online MBA program has grown, uh, other universities have experienced similar size declines in their MBA programs across the state. It's too soon to know how the accelerated model compares to others in terms of student experience, job prospects, or continuing student debt, but we'll be watching carefully. It's no surprise that Minnesota State's first contract with an online program management company happened at the university that has experienced the largest enrollment declines as in, uh, it, as, uh, and is in one of the most financially precarious situations. OPMs are predatory on at-risk campuses. Predatory, that's not my word. It is the word uh, that has been uh, used by members of Congress, by higher education reporters and opinion leaders, by students, and by administrators who have been caught on the wrong side of OPM contracts across the country. Their tactics and motivations are frequently compared to for-profit colleges, and some of the companies indeed grew out of failed for-profit institutions. However, now they don't need to come up with sham accreditation bodies or fake prestigious sounding names. They can simply exploit the accreditations and reputations of existing universities and colleges. Many of these companies have clauses in their contracts prohibiting the school from referring to them as online program managers or identifying their programs as different from their, the in-person versions of the programs. Some of them require that they be seated on boards of regents or trustees or otherwise have a seat at the university governance table. When universities have not realized a benefit from the OPM and try to enact their exit clauses in the contracts, they find the OPM companies to be very litigious, and schools that have exited such contracts have had to pay millions of dollars in fines and fees to do so. Since 2021, a second Min State University has signed a contract with an OPM company, Southwest Minnesota State University. Um, with, they've signed a contract with a company called Wiley to do marketing and recruitment of students for their online existing online programs. 
While Southwest's contract is far less problematic than the St. Cloud one, it also has a tuition share agreement of 35% for every student in, who enrolls in one of the course or programs that's marketed by the company, whether Wiley can prove that they recruited that particular student or not. With the passage last year of the North Star Promise, these tuition share agreements are pass-throughs of state money to for-profit companies who do not need to care about whether students are prepared for a program, uh, will uh, benefit from it, or have the resources at home to even access it. They see state and federal dollar signs and are happy to take advantage of student financial aid. Even students who don't pay a cent for tuition are hurt by these companies because they may waste, waste semesters of their precious financial aid resources on a program that they're not going to do well in. Um, and when they realize that they would benefit from an in-person experience, they have few credits left to their overall financial aid to use. This bill is meant to eliminate the tuition share model, essentially closing the loophole that the feds have opened up. It is also written to increase transparency for students, requiring that online program managers are identified as such in marketing and advertising materials. It sets up additional reporting requirements to the Office of Higher Education so that managed programs can be monitored to see how they perform compared to other programs. As the federal government drags its feet on closing this loophole, we can't wait any longer while our campuses are preyed upon by companies who only see our students as dollar signs. This bill will bring accountability and consumer protection to a new industry that already has gone unregulated for too long. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, members. This bill is going to uh, remain in the possession of the committee, so we're not going to take action on it today, but certainly questions. So if anyone has any questions, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question regarding the, um, the funds that are paid to these, uh, the third party. Is there a percentage of that that goes to the uh, universities or the institutions? President Chernega? No. Um, the, what happens is that a student who enrolls in that program pays tuition to the institution as they normally would, but the institution then passes over, in St. Cloud's case, 50% of that tuition to the company, and that's their fee for having marketed it. Representative McDonald. Thank you. Uh, and then question regarding the reporting. Um, let's see, um, I don't know if it's a question for Representative Coulter, but on your uh, page uh, two uh, regarding uh, uh, the reporting of the costs of the, of the program and the uh, amount of tuition and the aids received, the financial aid, is that also required in the universities in Minsk U of their other programs as well? Is that already the state law? President Trenega or Representative Coulter? Um, President Trenega. So right now, most of our campuses don't, I mean, some campuses may, but most of our campuses aren't out there advertising individual programs very heavily. Um, and so what this is really meant to do, these, these are particularly unique situations where an online MBA program, for example, is being marketed by this third party company. Um, so there isn't really an analogous other kind of program um, for other Min state programs out there um, because they're not contracting with companies to do this kind of work. Does that make sense? I mean, right, right now, for example, my sociology department spends zero dollars on marketing our department. So yes, there's no reporting requirement because we don't spend any money on that. Representative McDonald. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that makes uh, good sense at this point. Yeah. I just, I was looking at the, uh, I, I was reading the bill, Representative Coulter, and then the, uh, was notified of the uh, amendment. So I think I just need to review the amendment. I kind of ignored you when you were talking about that because I was <laughs> it's okay. I get reading the wrong. bill. <laughs> so my apologies. <laughs> so thank Re you, Mr. Chair, for now. Representative Robbins. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Coulter. Um, and I do have a couple questions. I don't want anyone taken advantage of. I totally get it. But the flip side of it is apparently there's hundreds of students in the MBA program at St. Cloud State that wouldn't have been there. So isn't this a moneymaker for St. Cloud State? Like, like if these marketing efforts are bringing in students that maybe are from out of state or this program aligns with what they want or whatever, 
I agree 50% seems kind of high, but it seems like if there's a way we can leverage these private contractors to drive up enrollment, that's a good thing. So I'm not sure, like, I get we should watch these contracts and we should, and I like giving it to the governing board to have authority for that, but I'm, I'm not convinced that we, with so much of life moving to digital and so many people wanting more flexibility and courses, as long as the governing board is really doing their job, I'm not sure why like, this wouldn't maybe be helpful in challenging enrollment times. President Chernega. So, um, Schnega, through the chair, please. Yes, uh, Chair Pulowski, Honorable Chair Pulowski, sorry, <laughs> Representative Robbins. Um, there are certainly arguments to be made for marketing programs, um, and there are lots of companies that provide those same services as fee for services. Um, but the tuition share version creates these adverse incentives for companies to market and cram students into the program, whether or not students are prepared well for it, whether or not they, the jobs they want are well linked to that program. Literally, these companies are just trying to fill as many seats as possible. Whereas when we do recruitment marketing through our own universities or hire companies as a, on a fee-for-service basis, we can say, well, we need students who are actually going to succeed in the program so that they don't, you know, spend their own money or lose their financial aid eligibility uh, for something that, that they're not going to be successful in. Um, and so while they are putting lots of students in these programs, we don't yet have data about if these students are successful, if they are, um, you know, getting the jobs that they want when they graduate. Um, it it does look appealing. I, I will remind folks, this was they launched four programs and only one of them got any enrollment at all. And so they spent money, resources, faculty spent time converting their courses over three months into this new format. And three of those programs didn't get any enrollment. And so the move into the undergraduate program was not because it was so successful at the graduate level. It was because it was so unsuccessful at the graduate level that they had to to meet their financial obligation to the company. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that answer. So would this um, have any infringement on the contract fee-for-service type model? President Chernega. Chair Pulowski, Representative Robbins, um, no. this bans the tuition sharing model, um, the version of the model that, that creates those perverse incentives, and then sets up reporting requirements. Representative Robbins. Last one, thank you. So I would like, I hope um, I saw some of the reporting requirements. In the DE, it's very cursory. In the underlying bill, it was sent to OHE, have it publicly available. In the DE, it's just like, oh, report to your governing board. So I would, I would actually prefer the reporting requirements of the underlying bill, personally. And secondly, I hope we're tracking that. Like, I would like to know how many students do graduate through these programs, because graduation numbers across the system aren't great. So I'd like to be able to compare that. And I'd also um, like to see how the marketing efforts and the contract ones pay off. And how that investment pays off. Because I do think there's a role for um, trying to attract new students. And I'm not saying, you know, this isn't problematic. I'm just saying, let's, let's make sure we're really tracking that and, um, and incentivizing what works for students and what works for the system. Because um, this move to digital and flexible and shorter courses and asynchronous learning, like it, it's here, so I, I don't want to miss opportunities for the state. Thank you. Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do agree that there's a space for online learning. I, I think it's really important. Um, in your testimony today, um, President Chernego, I, um, I may go. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that you said to me were like are really terrifying. Uh, one, intellectual property rights 
and that we're handing them over for to a for-profit entity to use whatever they want with someone's intellectual property. That's very concerning to me um, in a world where intellectual property is so important. Uh, secondly, I was very concerned with your statement about um, the non-compete between in-person and online, if I understood that correctly. Is that correct? President Chernega. Uh, Chair Pulowski, Representative Cleveborn, um, it, it's a non-compete with other all online programs. So for example, um, one of the programs that was targeted in the undergraduate set of, of programs was their online psychology program, which is one of their most popular programs, has been on entirely online for several years. Um, but that very popular, very successful online psychology program wouldn't be able to continue uh, if they were to launch this program through academic partnerships because it would be in direct competition. So they would have to close that entirely online program in, a, in exchange for this accelerated one. Thank you. Representative Cleaver. Um, and the, so the accelerated program is seven weeks and the other program is a longer period of time. Is that correct? President Chernega. Yes, Chair Pulowski, Representative Cleborn. Cleborn. Um, yeah, the, the regular online program has a normal 15 week semester to it. <laughs> Representative Cleaver. Thank you. So um, I, I think when students have a longer period of time and they are able to get comfortable with each other, oftentimes the conversation, even online, is more robust and there's a better learning experience for the students who participate in that group online discussion. Um, Chair, the other uh, issue that I was very concerning to me is if you're getting hundreds of students into an online program and there's not additional staff to support those students, that causes me a great pause with this type of a program. Um, I also think that we have to be really careful about where those federal and state dollars would go as far as making sure that they truly do benefit students and that the courses that they're taking will be transferable to other institutions or to any of the men's state programs. And I would ask, Mr. Chair, that we really look at this carefully so that that intellectual property that is paid for and developed by Minnesota academics continues to value uh, our state and that we are not uh, the generator for programming that would be given freely to other states without receiving any benefit. So I ask that we be very careful about uh, expanding these types of program management. Uh, and Representative Cleveland, we're going to keep the bill in committee just for that so we can continue to review it. Thank you very much. Representative Hicks. Thank you so much, Chair. And I actually think my question was answered because I was outcome based in my thought process. When will we have the first class that should mm -hmm. graduate? President Chernega. Um, Chair Pulowski, uh, Representative Hicks, um, that's a good question. I want to say that the first class was um, for the MBA program entered in the fall of 2022. Um, and so they may be graduating as soon as this spring, the spring of 2024, um, because I think it was set up to be a two year graduate program. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that, but I, I think that's the case. So we may have, have better data soon. Um, I will say that you know, we do know how online programs kind of compare in general to in-person programs across the country. And especially since the pandemic, there's been a lot of attention paid to retention in online versus in-person programs. And it's um, simply a matter of, of fact at this point that most online programs have lower retention rates uh, for students than most in-person programs, which is probably not surprising if you, you know, there's always going to be a group of students who register for online programs, don't connect very carefully with the courses, don't, you know, keep their um, screens off, for example, during Zoom calls and whatnot, um, and, and just don't feel connected and so end up dropping out more easily than, than they might in an in-person program where there's just more opportunities for faculty and staff to reach out and, and have those um, opportunities to see what's going on with a student. Um, 
I would just say too, you know, in terms of flexibility, uh, for more than 20 years, uh, the higher ed sector has been chasing after um, adult learners who have some college credits and no college degree. And that particular cohort is who companies like this say they will help. Um, institutions find uh, a group of people who they claim are not being served well by current uh, models, by current institutions. Um, higher ed has tried a number of things to do this in the past. None of them have been able to necessarily capture that market, no matter how flexible, how short, how asynchronous, how whatever. Um, and so they're just, they're, I'm not convinced that this model is, is a model that's going to be different than any others. And in fact, accelerated courses have been available to students for a number of years. Um, the St. Cloud State faculty who developed these courses could have easily developed them without this company's intervention um, because they still are the folks who know this material and ultimately develop the course. So um, it's, yeah, so that, that answers perhaps more of your question than you asked, but I wanted to let folks know. Thank you, Chair. So given that we're probably in the last quarter or last semester of this program, it would be very interesting to know how many people started, how many people are still there? Yeah. President Trinaga. Uh, Chair Pulowski, Representative Hicks, um, I agree. Um, I don't have access to that information right now. One of the features of these kinds of companies is that they want to keep data very secretive. They do not want transparency. Um, indeed, when we first asked for the co a copy of the addendum that expanded the program, the um, contract into undergraduate programs, this is what we received from, a, from St. Cloud State University as a state agency, they had redacted most of the document and claimed trade secrets as their reason, um, which I don't believe as state agencies we have the right to have trade secrets. So um, I don't have access to that data. I know, as I mentioned, Minnesota State um, System Office has set up some reporting requirements and may be able to get access to that data, certainly for the newly launched programs that are coming online. Um, but yeah, I, I am as anxious to see that data as you are. <laughs> Representative Hicks. I have one more follow up because I'm, perhaps I'm just, are you telling me that 50% of the tuition that was paid by students to help support the University of St. Cloud and subsequently the Minsky system is going to support a for-profit organization that has chosen to not disclose the success and success rates or lack of success rates for the students in the program when we require everyone else in the state system and the University of Minnesota not only to share it but to publicly share it and frankly we ask them really hard questions about it all the time <laughs> we're very very aware of the retention problem and the graduation problem and we ask them all kinds of hard questions so the for-profit agency that took tuition money that was supposed to benefit the university system ha is not required to share outcome data with the state of Minnesota that likely well, that didn't likely. That subsidizes that education. Did I get that right? President Janega. Chair Pulowski, Representative Hicks, the company will certainly not be sharing any of that information. University may share it, <laughs> is my hope. Um, but the, the company itself is, is unlikely to be sharing information. Um, in discussions with the Department of Education and the White House's policy um, director on higher education policy, uh, we've also heard that um, the companies um, have been very proactive at trying to um, not be subject to federal reporting requirements around a number of issues in higher education. Um, so there's, there's an interest in their part in reducing the amount of transparency. Representative Hicks. Uh, I don't have any more questions, Chair, but we've seen what happens when we give public dollars to educational institutions whose bottom line is the only um, guiding value they have. It's ended very poorly nationally and in the state of Minnesota, and so I am glad that we are keeping this bill in our possession, and I look forward to further conversation, because not okay. Thank you. Representative Bain. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Representative Hol Coulter, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, President Chernegat, I think you partially answered my question beforehand, uh, but I'm just going to clarify my question. So could there be cases of students uh, who has been misled about taking these programs, getting the degrees and certification, and it turns out they can't use it? President Chernegat. Uh, Chair Pulowski, Representative Vang, um, I believe that the MBA program is currently, um, the online program through academic partnerships is currently accredited in the same way as their in-person MBA program through AACSB. Um, I cannot, because I don't know the answer, um, I think that there were questions about the three failed programs, about whether or not those students would necessarily, they, they were in education, the master's programs in education, and I think there were some questions about whether an accelerated online program like this would have met the requirements that Pelsby sets out for those programs. Um, luckily, those programs, we don't have any of those students in there, um, but they launched them, and there could have been students in there. Um, the institution has continued to maintain that it they, that their Pelsby accreditation would have covered those um, uh, accelerated online programs, but I think that's one of the questions that led to them not being successful. Um, we have seen in California, um, at the University of Southern California, um, uh, online program managed program in social work uh, that enrolled thousands and thousands of students um, USC has a very prestigious social work program in person. Students thought that that's what they were registering for, and it turns out that the accreditation that they were um, qualified for after completing the online program was not the same as, as the certification they would have gotten in the in-person program. Um, so there do seem to be some significant opportunities, at least, for companies to mislead students, um, although this contract is new enough that that I'm not comfortable saying that has happened in Minnesota yet. Representing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no more follow-up questions, but I think it's very important that uh, we continue to keep a strong watch about these companies. Uh, we wanna make sure that our tuition dollars that we provide to our educational institutions are actually uh, helping students and helping them actually be able to utilize uh, their degrees and their certifications. Um, you know, uh, my concern is this could be an issue that we have helped dealt uh, a few years ago where for-profit schools have all of a sudden shut its door and have left students with nowhere to go. Um, and I don't want that situation and I don't, um, you know, don't want this to be a virtual version of what happened a couple years ago. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and this is to either one of the testifiers. I, <clears throat> I may have missed it, but how long are these contracts typically? Um, like how long is the St. Cloud State one? And I think you said down in Mankato as well. There's a contract. President Chernega. Yeah. Chair Pulowski, Representative, sorry, Robbins? Scott. Scott, sorry, thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, the St. Cloud State contract is a seven-year contract, um, which is a significant length of time for higher ed contracts. Um, most of the contracts that we sign with um, other companies that provide, say, our learning software programs so that students have a place to log in and get all of their assignments, those are often much shorter than that, especially initial contracts, um, as you're getting used to working with a company and seeing whether this is something you want to continue doing or if it's beneficial. Um, so yeah, the, the St. Cloud contract is a seven-year contract. I can't remember off the top of my head um, how long Southwest's contract is, but we can certainly get you that information. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a lengthy contract and one of the largest contracts that I've seen with an outside company like this um, at $27 million. So. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Representative Coulter, I don't, I don't know if you're open to adding some data collecting requirements, but to me, any contract going forward should have certain criteria for providing data to the university that the contract is with or the university or college. Um, and then, uh, obviously, if, if 
if they don't want to abide by Minnesota law, then, but, you know, as I told my kids, tough noogies, <laughs> you know. Um, we do that in other areas of law. We say this has to be a part of the contract, and uh, that way we can assure that taxpayers are getting their money's worth uh, and, and tuition payers are, are as well. Thanks. Uh, Representative Coulter, one last comment, and the bill will remain in I'm sorry. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Cleveland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm just curious. I just opened up St. Cloud's online program, and I'm just wondering, how would a student know which classes are offered by St. Cloud and which ones are offered in this other managed program? President Chernea. Chair Pulowski, Representative Cleveborn, they don't. Yeah. Oh. Representative Cleveborn, uh, for once, the use of the phone in committee was <laughs> actually providing accurate information. <laughs> well, because it says at St. Cloud State, we offer nationally ranked programs. And if we have programs that don't meet that statement, then we are, in fact, bait and switch. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yeah, there may be two definitions of the word rank, though. <laughs> We, we assume the highest caliber from our state institutions. Sure, Thank you. I wasn't you. thinking of that one when you showed me that. Uh, <laughs> Representative Coulter, uh, to your bill. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, members, for the, the really, really good discussion. And, and um, as far as reporting and, and data collection requirements, absolutely happy to continue that conversation. I think um, I'm generally of the, of the opinion if we want something, we should ask for it. Um, but I, I think a lot of folks made really, really important points about why, frankly, we just need to get ahead of it. And arguably, we maybe haven't yet, but um, now is better than tomorrow. And, um, you know, when we, the fact that, for example, there is no, unless and until this bill passes, no definition of what an online program manager even is in state law is to me very concerning. So, um, you know, I think at the end of the, the day, this bill just, um, it reigns in some of the harmful practices that we've seen around the country and even to a certain extent here, um, and really does provide critical oversight to ensure that OPMs are doing what they're supposed to do and serving our colleges and universities and ultimately our students well. Um, obviously, we know the, the significant investment that the state makes in our colleges and universities, and given the size and importance of that investment, um, I think it is critical that we prevent the predatory and dishonest practices that we've seen in other states uh, and ensure that our, our colleges and universities, lawmakers, and Minnesotans have the information available to make the right decisions. Thank you. And thank you both. This is a, a very high priority for the committee. So we will be following this. And if more language needs to be added, Representative Scott, you have the opportunity to do so before we would put the bill together. So thank you both. Members, our vice chair is missing, so I will move the minutes of March 7th. Any discussion to that motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed nay? Motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. Members, I'm going to put before the committee House File 1630. Uh, this is the one-third user finance requirement elimination. Representative Knorr, I think you mentioned this at the last committee meeting. And we're going to take a look now at the language that we've been working on for the better part of a year. So I will ask the indulgence of the committee. I'm going to move the DE1 amendment so the bill is in order. So members, all those in favor of the DE1 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed nay? Motion prevails. And now I'm going to have Mr. Hopkins walk us through the DE1 amendment. Mr. Hopkins. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the DE1 amendment to House File 1630 creates a new section of statute stating that it's the policy of the legislature that in its, um, in its bond issuances, when it bonds for capital projects for higher education institutions, um, it will seek to fund the entirety, the entire cost of those higher education projects, and it will not require the higher education systems to, play, to pay any part of the debt service um, on those bond sales. Members, this was a discussion that goes back to when Representative Alice Hausman was chairing the Capital Investment Committee in 2013 and 2014, and there was a similar chair chairing this committee. Uh, the concern was the fact, <laughs> the concern was the fact that this was being used as a way to increase tuition. And the initial concept of this was that if they used tuition to help pay for these projects, it would somehow slow the number of new projects. 
Well, it did just the opposite, and it increased them. We now know that we are in a, a dire problem here with tuition increases, and it has impacted our enrollment, and it has priced a whole section of, I think, this country out of a higher education uh, or any type of education. So we're going to remain in possession of this. We have this discussion with uh, Chairman Lee, so he's aware of it. We uh, are not as fortunate yet with Senator Pappas, but we're hopeful that we can convince her that this would be properly used uh, in the higher ed bill or the capital investment bill. So it's just going to be kept inside the committee, unless there are any questions. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, while I certainly understand your explanation, um, does this do anything to quell the um, building of brand new buildings constantly and then in the future then the state's on the hook for, for maintaining those buildings? Um, Representative Scott, I would hope it would because those of us on the Capital Investment Committee and those committees that are finance committees that have the responsibility of certain capital investment projects would take a look at the totality of the cost here and say that some of these buildings are simply beginning to be too expensive. And putting these on the uh, backs of the students, particularly students in the form of tuition that would have to pay it off for 10 or 20 years, is simply obnoxious. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that explanation. And so is your expectation with this is that tuition will not go up? My expectation is that this will not cause tuition to go up. <laughs> I can't. I would love to control tuition completely. Um, and I think we've sent the message strongly to both systems that you just can't always say 3.5%, 3.5%, and it's okay. It's destroyed both of them, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, members. Representative Cleveland, did you have a question? Well, just really a comment. You know, when new buildings are built, um, they are designed with a useful life for the technology, for the systems that are there. And I think we always have to be mindful. It's not a blanket statement that all new buildings are bad or good, no. but that we need to meet the needs of Minnesotans, whatever that might look like in the future. And I agree, Representative Cleveland, but I think this was put into place under the assumption that if we put this burden on the campuses and students, it would slow down these new building requests and certainly that has not been the case. So, Fully supportive of your bill. Thank you. Thank you, members. I'm going to go to House File 4175, and I'm going to make a motion to have it placed on the General Register. We, we handled this bill in the last committee meeting. Uh, this is going to be a vehicle bill, but given recent actions of the Senate as of yesterday, uh, it might become more than a vehicle bill depending on the stability of the Senate and how we are going to be able to handle legislation going between the two bodies. So mm -hmm. my primary motion is just to send it to the General Register. Change. It may become more than just a little bill dealing with a change of one word, and uh, that will depend on the volatility of our friends in the Senate. So that's my motion, members. Any questions to the motion? Representative Colt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a, not a question, but I'm, I'm sure I speak for members of this committee on both sides that I'm uh, always uncomfortable with depending on the stability of the Senate. Thank you. Yes, and, and I could repeat that long. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. But there, there is a statement about the Senate and the House, but I'll save that for private <laughs> conversation. Um, members, any other discussion? Seeing no other discussion, then my motion is House File 4175 be placed on the General Register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Meeting is adjourned.